The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome to this week's show. Yes, I am in the studio. Is If you're watching video, you can see over my shoulder the view here in northern Colorado. This week's show is a dig deeper show. So previous show, we talked about uh, what is innovation. Kind of taking a step back and giving a little context, background, laying a little foundation work. Um, and in this week, we're going to pick up um, and a topic that we kind of skimmed in the, the previous show. In the previous show, we talked about what is innovation, but in that, we talked about the uses or what some people refer to as the types of innovation. So this week, we're going to spend the entire episode talking about the types of innovation, the three types that I use when I think about innovation, and that includes institutional innovation, social innovation, and technological innovation. But within each of those, I wanted to share with you a little bit of background and context around also funding models. The funding models across those are distinctly different, and you have to consider things. Now, in the future, we're going to get into more detail about how do you fund your innovations, how do you fund your ideas. So we're going to give at least a little bit of introduction in today's show. Now, beyond those three types, we are also today going to talk about digging deeper. It isn't just about having an idea in one of those three types, but it's also about digging deeper, really taking a look at what is the idea, who's going to get the benefit of it, and why should they care? So you want to stay all the way to the end, that we will cover at the end of today's segment. But before we hop into the segment, go ahead and like today's show. Share it, subscribe, so that you don't miss any of the future episodes of Kill Innovations. And by the way, we're now in season 16. Yes, we've been doing this show since 2005. And you can hop over to killinnovations.com and you can uh, go back and search through the entire archive. Yes, all the way back to 2005. And so with that, I'm going to shut up here. Let's go ahead. And let's jump into this week's segment. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom. Institutional innovations is just one of the types of innovation, but this is the one that is most commonly overlooked by most organizations. We're all focused on other kinds of innovation, other kinds of things that maybe, you know, the shiny object problem. But institutional innovation can be just as impactful and is not something that you should overlook. Now, what is institutional innovation? Institutional innovation applies to organizations, teams, companies, industries even, and even governments. It's about how that institution operates. You know, it covers everything from uh, things like policies, um, procedures, org structure, um, standards, uh, relationships, supply chain, partners, etc. Now, in most cases, when we think about institutional innovation, we're thinking about organizations and uh, teams, uh, businesses, um, nonprofit organizations, those types of things. But it also applies to entire industries, um, industries such as industry structure. How does the industry operate? Um, partnering or what sometimes I will refer to as uh, co-innovation opportunities between uh, within a within a given industry, um, self regulation industries that come together to solve issues, such that they uh, self regulate rather than having um, government regulation imposed upon them. 
that is all areas of organizations and organizations that can um, be impacted. Now, the question I get a lot about organizational decisions, why does it get overlooked? Well, it's kind of the day-to-day stuff. It's kind of the thing that we just do. We have our procedures, we have our uh, activities, and we don't go back and address them. We don't think about innovating them. Um, in in my career, working for very large organizations of hundreds of thousands of employees, one of the challenges you run into is what I call the corporate hairball. New policies, new procedures, new rules, new forms to be filled out. Just continue to add and add and add and add until you've got this corporate hairball. And nobody ever takes a hair off the hairball. Everybody's good about adding one on. Nobody ever takes one off in this process. So focusing and challenging your innovation efforts about how to improve the organization, organizational innovation, can have a huge impact. One story, taught an innovation boot camp course at HP, where I was the CTO at the time. Somebody in the course who worked in an operational role, did not work in R&D, did not work in the innovation team, did not work at HP Labs. Somebody else in, in HP took the course, came up to me afterwards, and I challenged people to take on a project, take something out of the boot camp and apply it to something that's going to improve HP. This person came to me and said, you know, I, I work in finance. What am I going to do? And I said, well, take a look at organizational innovation. And they went off and they challenged the kind of status quo on how expense reporting was done. The forms that employees had to fill out in the process of getting your expenses approved throughout all of HP. Now, remember, at this time, we were 200,000 plus employees in 135 countries. You can imagine the complexity around expenses. This person really went after it and took total Uh, time for an employee to fill out an expense report from about 40 minutes average, filling in all the forms, Xeroxing your receipts, stapling them or faxing them or scanning them in to be sent in. They took what was 40 to 45 minutes and took it down to 20 minutes. Half the time. Now think about that. 20 minutes times how many trips every employee took times more than 200,000 employees. The impact was huge. This thing, it was massive. The person won a, a, a recognition by the CEO, got a big bonus. Do not overlook organizational innovation. Now, how do you fund organizational innovations? What's the funding model around this? Well, there's a couple different ways. You could be an entrepreneur. You could go off and Uh, Write an application to do expense reporting that is more efficient and you sell them to corporations. So you can do it as as an entrepreneur, which means you're going to go out and you're going to find angel investors or venture capitalists or or maybe even get a customer to fund it. Um, Or you're going to go do an incubator like Techstars or any of the other big incubators around. That's one way. The other is, is to be an intrapreneur, an entrepreneur that's inside of the organization. So if you work inside of of an organization of any size, you can be an intrapreneur. You're the one coming up with all these great ideas. And the funding model then is to search out formal funding. Maybe there's dollars set aside for funding innovations or new ideas or informal funding. Go fight for budget dollars. Go get a manager to support or endorse the project that you want to work on. So. Those are primarily the two funding models around uh, institutional innovation. So again, institutional innovation is one that commonly gets overlooked, but shouldn't, because the impact it can have on any organization, a small team of five people, to organizations that are hundreds of thousands of employees operating around the world. Institutional innovation can be huge. Do not overlook it. And don't get intimidated by the funding model. It takes work, but trust me, it is worth it. Social innovation has also gotten a fair amount of attention. It gets driven by the social priorities that have come up in everybody's mind. 
Uh, and what do I mean by social innovation? What I mean by social innovation are those innovations that have some form of positive social impact. Now, that includes things like uh, employment or quality of life or serving some form of social purpose like the environment or equality, uh, whatever the, the, the social agenda. Clean water is one that uh, I've been involved in um, a lot over, uh, over my own career. Now, the social innovations are numerous. They are uh, uh, widespread, um, and it's driven a lot by the innovator's passion. Uh, if you are interested in the environment, specifically clean water, then work on ideas and generate ideas that you are passionate about that are going to solve those social innovation needs. Um, other, another way to look, think about social innovation is, is it may not be standalone. It may actually be part of other innovations. So you may be working on an innovation inside of an organization, what we call institutional innovation, that then also looks at uh, employment. Of how do you employ uh, or add diversity to your employment model around uh, an institutional innovation? That's valid, too. So social innovation is not just standalone, but can be used or influenced across uh, the broader set of organizations. Now, there, the, the range of social innovation can be varied. It, it, again, it's tied to what you want to be passionate about. Likewise, funding social innovation, the funding model, typical funding model for social innovation, can also be very wide and, and come from a variety of different areas. Uh, that can be what we call social impact investment. And these are from people who are less concerned about some form of equity return. Uh, like I want to get three to five times my money in five to seven years. That's kind of the rule for venture capitalists. Social innovation, that's not the measurement for social impact investors. Social impact investors put money in because they're also passionate about that. And it's more about seeing what that impact is rather than getting a return. So finding those people who are passionate about the same thing and getting them sold on what it is your project is, that becomes effectively the funding model uh, you should think about. Another is, is, you know, is the uh, traditional uh, angel and VCs. These are people who are going to look for a return now. It may not be the same level of return. They're not looking for three to five times their money. They're looking to, you know, get normal market returns, 8% a year or whatever uh, their target is. Um, and those, though, you still need to find those people who are looking for a return, but less of a return, but who also see the social benefit, see the social impact for the social innovation that you want to propose. And then the third area is grants, grants and awards. Grants coming from government agencies, foundations, uh, philanthropists, uh, 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 NGO organizations, uh, World Bank. Uh, I've gotten funding from all of those. I did a fair amount of work in World Bank, and, and they can be very, very supportive of funding models that don't match any of the other cases. So you have to get a little creative when you're working on social innovation efforts. You have to get creative beyond just the traditional knocking on doors, showing a great presentation. This is a passion cell. And look, social innovation is, is becoming more and more important, both as those areas that we are all passionate about, or if we all innovated in social areas, social impact areas, social innovations that we are passionate about, we can have a phenomenal impact on the world that we leave for our kids and on my kids, for my grandkids. In this case, though, you got to get a little bit, you got to get a little creative. The funding models can be a little bit different and they can be a little challenging. But finding like-minded people and convincing them of your interest and your passion, you can create social innovations that will have huge impact, that will change the world and leave the world a better place. Now, technological innovation is one is is the one that we most 
commonly think about. It's the shiny object. It's the new gadget. It's the new technology that we will get excited about, whether it's a new mobile phone or a new tablet or a new camera or a new piece of software, whatever it is. Now, the technological innovations, though, are not just tied to the gadgets. They can be technologies that apply in different kinds of ways. It could be scientific know-how, could be uh, chemical in the nature of uh, new pharmaceuticals. It could be uh, the technology of a manufacturing process. Now, many key people think that the manufacturing process should be a institutional innovation. But if that process involves a certain level of science, technology, expertise, we classify that as technological innovation. Um, now, in many cases of the technology innovations, it's around uh, some form of unique combination, the unique set of expertise and background and putting that together in a very specific way that creates something new, something different, something that didn't exist. Now, those elements all may have existed. So it doesn't like you have to go invent the technology from the ground up. This is a innovation area where in many cases it may just be connecting the dots. You say, hmm, you know, I saw that article about this new kind of chemistry, and I saw this piece about some, you know, study around the impact of these chemicals on plant life. If I put those two together, do they create something new? That is technological innovation. You don't have to invent each piece. You may be that person that just puts them together in a unique and different way. And as a result, that's where you create something new, something different, something that's going to have a huge impact. Now, the funding op options for technological innovation are massive. There are all kinds of ways. Uh, now, I'm going to break this down into what we call equity and non-equity, non-dilutive, and I'll explain that here in a second. But for instance, angel investing. Angel investors are friends and family, uh, people who don't do um, uh, venture funding as, a, as kind of a core part of their business. They may be a doctor, lawyer, had some success, got a little extra money. They're going to throw it into the pot and hopefully get some kind of a return. Angel investors kind of have a lower bar to be the first ones into an investment round. Um, again, the most common are friends and family, people you know, people that uh, trust you. They're investing in you uh, to kind of get your idea going. Um, next is venture capital. These are the professional uh, investors who invest in. Uh, companies uh, that are trying to create uh, new businesses, new startups, new markets, new technologies. Um, and there's VCs who invest in different levels. Some of them will do early round when, when the idea isn't quite proven out. Then middle stage, where you're funding for expansion, or late stage, funding to... Uh, uh, accelerate growth to get to some kind of an exit, like an acquisition or a, uh, IPO, initial public offering of stock shares. Um, and so VCs cover all that. Now, VCs are equity. Angels are also equity. You're going to sell a portion of your company in order to get that money. Another option out there is corporate venture capital. So these are big, large corporations who set up a venture capital arm who make investments, but their model's a little different. They're going to invest in areas of interest that could impact their corporate entities. Maybe they're going to invest in a, in a small company because that company uh, could deliver some technology that they could use that could, they could have a positive impact downstream. So. Corporate venture capitalists being a little bit different when it comes to technological innovation. You could just get customer funding. Get a customer, sell them on the idea. They fund it because they want to buy it because they want early access to the technology. 
The benefit of customer funding is, is in some cases, you can structure that to be non-dilutive. You keep control of your company, but the customer gets it. They pay you. In many cases, it's structured like a consulting agreement, et cetera. But that's one way to fund many technological innovations. And I would do these types of investments all day long at HP, where a small startup had a really great idea. It wasn't quite proven out. Um, and it didn't make sense for HP to acquire it because it benefited from having broader industry support than just one uh, entity. So in that case, we uh, we would just make a little investment. Now, I'm, I was never big on equity investments, but I would make these kinds of customer investments where I would invest and in return get uh, priority access to it, be able to use it first, be able to launch with it, those types of things. And then you got grants. You can do things that are non-dilutive, like uh, SBIR here in the United States. It's called Small Business Innovation Research Grants. They're given by the, the U.S. government. Many other governments do the same thing, where they'll fund a really early stage idea because of its uh, potential positive impact. Maybe it's funding to create jobs. There's some other driver for it. Um, and it's non-dilutive. You get the money, you do not have to give up um, equity. So, so with technological innovation, it's the, it's the shiny object, it's the new thing, not just tied to gadgets. Remember that technology can have a play from a chemistry perspective to a manufacturing process to all kinds of things. Um, but technological innovation is the one where most People, when they think about the word innovation, that is where uh, people are innovating today. And the funding models are just as varied. Um, in fact, in the case of technological innovation, funding is more prevalent. It is still hard. You know, it's something less than 1% of companies that have an idea ever get funded. So just be aware that when you come up with the technological innovation, you are going to have a hard slog to get that funding. Find people who can help you. Find people who can support your idea. Find people who can open up doors for you is key to success when you're looking at funding your ideas, especially in technological innovation because it's such a crowded field. Everybody is developing those. Now, when you think about the types of innovation, so we've talked about Institutional, we probably talked about social innovation, we talked about technological innovation. You have to be careful from the standpoint of just thinking, okay, I've got this idea and I bucket as a social innovation, or I bucket as a technological innovation, or as institutional innovation. You have to dig deeper. You got to dig deeper to really think about the, the elements that determine kind of is this idea really interesting? And the way I think about these is I put them into three. Um, chunks, I guess is the best way to describe it. Three elements that I think about whenever I'm thinking about a new idea. First out is, is the what. What is the idea? What is this thing? Is it a, a particular process to improve uh, expense reporting? Uh, think about that and, and kind of figure out what the box is. You know, write some text, describe it in such a way that people kind of get an idea of what that is. What is it? What is this innovation that you are proposing? The next chunk that I think about is the who. Who is this innovation for? Who is it going to impact? And what are their drivers? Why would they be interested in this thing? What is it that, they def that defines them as unique? So in the case of, I'm going to create an innovation that's for institutions and organizations, they're going to improve their expense reporting. The who? People who've got to fill out expense reports. I'm going to make it easy for them. But is that all of it? No. There's other who's. There's the finance department, streamlining it so they spend less time dealing with expense reports and going back and finding a receipt that someone didn't attach, right? 
Is there another? Yeah. The third area is the broader finance organization dealing with uh, timeliness of getting expense reports, expense reports paid, makes for happier staff, reduced burden, all of those issues, right? So there can be multiple who's for any idea that you are thinking about. So define the what and understand not just the primary who, but all of the who's that get impacted, all those people, all those teams, all those parts of the organization that can be, or customers, if you're dealing with social innovation, right? You Fresh water in Africa. Well, it's obviously the people that are going to now have fresh water, but another who could be what? The government. Clean water, better health, increasing you know, average lifespan, all benefits the society. So the government could also be a beneficiary in this example. Same thing with technological. The who could be the customer. Could be the retailer selling your innovation. That's a benefit to them. So think deeply about who is going to get the benefit. Who is going to see this as a positive? And the third area is why. Why should they care? Why should they care about your idea? I get pitched hundreds of times a month with new ideas. People contact me in email, sending, or getting me on the phone and pitching me their new innovation. And the one area that most innovators do not think about is why. Why should I care? Why should anybody care about this idea? Well, if you've defined the what, what is it? You've defined the who, who's the target beneficiary. The why is digging into why should they care? Why should a customer care? Why should a retailer care? Why should the government care if it's a social innovation? Why should the finance department care? Is there enough of an impact of this idea to make them care? So the who, the what, and the why. Those are the three pieces, and you need to think about all three of them. And when you're done thinking about the why, go back and think about the who. Maybe you discover a new person or a new team that could benefit from this idea. So it's not just about coming up with an idea and sitting back and going, ooh, I think that's interesting. It is about digging deeper. What is it? Who gets the benefit from it? And why should they care? Thanks for joining me today in today's show. Hope you found that beneficial as we talked about the three types of innovation, institutional, social, and technological. Don't get hung up on the technological one. It's the one that People th tend to think it's pretty sexy, but you can have just as much, if not more, impact by looking across all of the types of innovation and thinking about how you can solve the problems that people are facing today. If you'd like to get more experience about how to apply all of this within your organization or within your team, or to learn it as a skill to advance your own career, check out the Disruptive uh, Ideation Workshop. It's disruptiveideation.com. This course is taught by the Innovators Network. Uh, I've licensed this workshop and all of my workshop to the Innovators Network, so you can go over and check that out. You can also go to their site at theinnovators.network. Now, I would also invite you to join me over in the Innovators community. Uh, this is a place where we have uh, innovators from all sizes and shapes and industries in different parts of the world. So this is everything from chief innovation officers from Fortune 100 companies all the way down to college students um, who are working on ideas as part of projects um, in, their, in their coursework. And this is a community where you can come in. It's free. There's no charge to join the community. There's no charge to be a member of the community to communicate and get connected. But it's a community where people come together to help each other out, give feedback on ideas, uh, potentially you know, ask for 
uh, support and introductions to find funding um, or just to uh, beef up on skill sets and find get advice on how to uh, set up innovation activities within your organization. So go over and visit the Innovators community. The URL is theinnovators.community uh, and join. Like I said, it's free of charge. You can check that out. You can join. You can uh, get plugged in with other innovators from around the world. Now, as I wrap up today's show, the one favor I would ask of you is to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Second layer, share. I started doing this podcast in 2005, and the reason I did it was basically to satisfy the request from my early mentor. When I asked this mentor, Bob Davis, how I paid him back, he laughed. He says, you can't pay me back. You have to pay it forward. I've had a phenomenally successful career. I look back on my mentors and give them a huge amount of credit for the success I've been able to achieve and to satisfy that instruction from my mentor to pay it forward. We started this back in 2005. All of the content is free of charge. You can use it. You can apply it to your organization, your business. All I ask is, is help spread the word. Share this with others by helping me pay it forward and sharing today's episode so that they can find it, enjoy, benefit from it, and they can have Better, better and larger impactful innovations coming out of their ideas. And with that, thanks again, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Podcasting nonstop since 2005, this has been the Killer Innovation Show on the Innovators Network. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network.